Good morning. We will uh, commence with the meeting of the curators of the University of Missouri. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome everyone uh, and to express our appreciation to Chancellor Schrader for her hospitality and in all that they've done to make this uh, meeting successful as we start out here this morning. Uh, we also remind everybody that we do have people who are joining us by live stream. So uh, uh, if you're going to speak, speak into the microphone. I will officially call this meeting of the Board of Curators to order. And uh, this is one of the fun things of being a member of the Board of Curators because we get to welcome three new members to our board this morning. And as is our tradition and required by our collected rules, I would ask our board secretary, Cindy Harmon, now to move to the podium and we will call our three new curators to the podium one by one to take the oath and receive their curator's pen. First of all, I'd like to ask new curator, Daryl Chapman, to go forward. Daryl's a uh, resident of Forest Hill, Missouri. Got his undergraduate degree from University of Missouri, graduate degrees from both University of Missouri and North Carolina State, a law degree from the University of Missouri. Uh, he is currently, Daryl is currently the general counsel for the Missouri Department of Agriculture. Two weeks ago, he received a citation of merit from the Missouri College of Agriculture at the University campus and he will be a commencement speaker uh, in May at the College of Agriculture. Cindy? I'm Daryl Chapman, do solemnly swear. I'm Daryl Chapman, do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Missouri. And the Constitution of the State of Missouri. And that I will faithfully demean myself. Next, I'd ask Jamie Farmer, also one of our newest curators, to stand with Cindy. Uh, Jamie uh, got her undergraduate degree in the business administration from the University of Missouri School of Business, her MBA from Washington University in St. Louis, and is currently the president of uh, Capital Sand Propens, a large sand supplier to the fracking industry. Uh, her company is the largest supplier of processed sand in Missouri. Welcome, Janie. I, Jamie Farmer, do solemnly swear. I, Jamie Farmer, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. Jeff Lehman from Springfield, Missouri. Jeff received his undergraduate degree from Missouri State, and he is currently a senior portfolio manager and founder of the Lehman Group with Morgan Stanley. And Jeff has 20 years of experience in wealth management, and Jeff, we welcome you. Cindy? I, Jeff Lehman, do solemnly swear. I, Jeff Lehman, do solemnly swear.
We'll move now into the uh, general business portion of the agenda. Uh, an informational item, you'll see that uh, the first item is review of the consent agenda. We'll get to action on the consent agenda action later, but it's on page five of your materials, uh, seven, seven consent items. Uh, are there any uh, motions or requests for removal? If there are no requests for removal, we'll take those up at the appropriate time. Next, uh, some action items. Uh, recently, uh, all of the curators have received the committee appointments for the board. That would include the executive committee and the various standing committee assignments. Uh, the court, or the uh, court, the, uh, the, the chair would, the chair would uh, entertain a motion to approve so moved. The committee assignments. Second. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, you call the roll. Curator Chapman. Just say yes or no. Yes. Curator Farmer. Yes. Curator Graham. Yes. Curator Lehman. Yes. Curator Phillips. Yes. Curator Snowden. Yes. Curator Steelman. Yes. Okay. You have all votes in favor. Next, uh, all of the uh, members of the board have received from our Secretary Cindy the uh, meeting calendar for the year 2018. And uh, this time the chair would entertain a motion to approve that 2018 calendar for the Board of Curators. Second. Cindy, would you call the roll? Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Farmer? Yes. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. Okay. You have all votes in favor. As is indicated by the, uh, the agenda, we do have several items that will be taken up in executive session during the two-day period. And uh, even though we're not going to move into executive session at this time, uh, the chair would entertain a motion to uh, adjourn into executive session at the appropriate time. So moved. Second. Cindy, would you call the rule? Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Farmer? Yes. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. All votes in favor. Thank you. And next, we uh, move to an information item, and then we're delighted to have Chancellor Cheryl Schrader. And Cheryl, we thank you for the great work you've provided to, to S&T and the system over the years, and, and wish you the best at, uh, at Wright State. And thank you for presenting now strategic plan highlights for S&T. Well, thank you so much for, for those kind words, Curator Graham. It uh, is bittersweet. Uh, and certainly um, it has been a wonder wonderful opportunity for me to have the pleasure of working with you. So good morning to everyone. We are very honored to be able to host the University of Missouri System Board of Curators today. And I do want to make sure that, that you are welcomed and hope that you have a very enjoyable and productive meeting here at s and I do appreciate the opportunity to share with you some of the progress that we've been making on our strategic plan. And the plan is titled, Rising to the Challenge, Missouri S&T's Strategy for Success. Since the summer of 2012, we have worked diligently to create and implement a strategic plan that reflects both the shared values and the unique attributes that define Missouri s and This bold plan will guide us till 2020 <clears throat> and beyond. So let me begin where we started in this process, and that is articulating the vision for our campus. Our vision for Missouri s and is to be the leading public technological research university that's known for discovery, creativity, and innovation. Digging deeper, our vision continues. We will cultivate curiosity, creativity, and also confidence 
and our graduates. We will be the institution of choice for partners around the world seeking a highly qualified, talented, and entrepreneurial workforce, innovative research, relevant educational programs, products, and services, and technology and ideas to solve the great challenges of our time. To achieve this vision, we worked through an inclusive collaborative process to identify our strategy. How are we going to achieve that vision? And I like to refer to this as our elevator speech. Our statement says that we will provide by 2020, right? 2020 is the year we will be 150 years old as an institution. By 2020, a top return on investment among public research universities to our key customer groups, and those include students, employers, research partners, and donors. Through leveraging what makes us um, unique and what we are known for, through extraordinary access to renowned expertise, services, and experiential learning opportunities. Similar to our process in developing our campus master plan, which I'll have the opportunity to speak about later today, we seek buy-in from our camp customer groups for the strategic plan. And, and it is not by coincidence that a lot of collaboration occurs. As part of our mid-cycle opportunity review this year, in November 2016, we brought together approximately 200 individuals, including faculty, staff, students, and alumni, to review our strategic plan. And they made several recommendations to update the plan's levers and themes and actions. These were shared in open fora this spring, and uh, we had the opportunity to post all of the recommendations online so that individuals and groups could review and provide comment as well. The updated plan uh, was posted in March with another chance for feedback after collecting all of this information. And uh, we also will be spending time uh, next month really reviewing the metrics and making some adjustments as well. Uh, as, as you can recall, Curator Phillips, we hit some 2020 goals very early on and have sat down and, and are looking at uh, readjusting those and putting some bold goals out forward as well. So it's important that everyone with a vested interest in Missouri S&T has the chance to share and shape the university's future. To achieve our strategic goals, our four themes are listed uh, on the screen. First, to develop and inspire thinkers, creative thinkers and leaders for lifelong success. Not just students, but our faculty, staff, alumni as well. To enhance our reputation and raise our visibility nationally and internationally. To achieve sustainable growth, to ensure that best return on investment and to increase and facilitate meaningful access to and interaction with renowned faculty, staff, and services. We have made significant progress in every one of these themes. And so on this slide, I've just listed those levers we are currently engaged in at this time. A one-page handout describing the uh, strategic plan themes and levers has been provided to you, so I don't expect you to memorize the different uh, numbers here. And there's another one-page handout that summarizes recent progress over the past six months uh, and over the past year as well. So allow me to share just a few highlights of our progress. I'll begin with theme one, and that again is to dis develop and inspire creative thinkers and leaders for lifelong success. Missouri S&T's strategic plan has a built-in mechanism for fostering innovation through the creation and implementation of the innovation team. This team was designed to seize entrepreneurial opportunities, innovative approaches, and those aha moments 
that are brought forward by individuals or groups who are interested in making a difference. And it is actually modeled after a similar program at Procter & Gamble that encourages innovation from the bottom up. Our campus, I, I would say that uh, this last year we added a, a, an additional feature to the innovation team as they distribute innovation funds. Uh, we do now have a minor tank that's modeled after the shark tank uh, approach. Our campus community is full of innovators. The innovation team received 50 innovation proposals in fiscal year 2016, and the team was able to fund 20 of these proposals. And um, they now evaluate them, uh, as I mentioned, through the, the minor tank approach. A booklet included in your packet summarizes these investments, which includes an acupuncture MRI probe for skin care detection, a smart chair in use by patients at Phelps County Regional Medical Center for pilot studies with um, patients of cognitive health, and also maker spaces where members of the campus community can design, build, and work on personal projects. Also, under theme one, in lever 1.1, our undergraduate students are required to complete a significant experiential learning component before graduation. And this requirement that our graduates, um, this, this really makes sure that our graduates are ready to make an immediate positive impact in the workplace. Examples may include study abroad, internships, conducting research, significant leadership experiences, and even participating on a design team. While on campus, we want to ensure that our students have the resources they need at their fingertips. And as part of Lever 1.2, we transformed our library into a learning commons where technology supports teamwork and collaboration. Since doing this, we've increased our door count by 33% in 2016 when compared to 2013. Enhancing reputation and raising visibility nationally and internationally is our second theme. And I want to highlight lever 2.1 under that theme. Through the strategic initiative process, we have now filled 42 additional faculty lines as part of our ambitious faculty hiring initiative. We are in the process of hiring another 18 additional faculty who will begin this coming fall. And so soon we will reach 60% of our goal to add 100 faculty by 2020. This is in addition to filling any vacancies that we have. Our new faculty members represent departments across campus, from uh, policy to psychological science and from civil engineering to uh, computer science as well. I would also like to note that we recorded our one millionth download from Scholars Mine, our uh, online repository of research papers and creative works that have been produced by our faculty our staff and our students. Scholars Mine has a global reach. During one 24-hour period, for example, s and scholarly documents were downloaded by individuals in England, Thailand, Nigeria, and Los Angeles. Our next theme is to look at achieving sustainable growth and ensure best return on investment. Lever 3.3 calls for us to enhance our research and student learning. And during a presentation about our master plan later today, you'll hear about how we've invested in laboratory upgrades. A pilot project began several years ago whereby we were able to secure $500,000 uh, from the system and strategic initiative money. And we, we raised and matched additional monies to invest $1.8 million in 11 instructional laboratories on campus. Well, what we did this year 
is we actually allocated $500,000 of recurring dollars to the colleges so that um, they can match dollar for dollar every year. And so every year, the idea is there is $1 million to be invested in not only instructional labs, but also research laboratories. Um, we are in the middle of a very successful first year. Uh, there are, are wonderful developments occurring in both colleges with many partners stepping up to help. Um, I must say that, that this, as well as many other um, ideas, are being taken into consideration with our budget alignments. Um, but if we do have to uh, perhaps put a hold on this program, we do have some cost dollars that will allow us to continue to invest in laboratories uh, in any case. So you'll hear later today about how uh, we have expanded student housing and dining options. As part of Lever 3.8, we model fiscal, environmental, and social sustainability practices in daily operations. More than 25 of our buildings feature refill water bottle stations to reduce the waste of one-time use bottles. And plus, our dining services contractual agreement contains stipulations for effective waste management. The final area that I'm going to highlight is theme four, increase and facilitate meaningful access to and interaction with renowned faculty, staff, and services. We identified our PhD enrollment, enrollment as an area that we needed to grow. In 2016, we launched a new initiative that's designed to grow graduate and research programs by recruiting some of the nation's and the world's top talent. We are investing over $3 million in recurring funds annually for this program, which will cover tuition and fees for qualified graduate students. In addition, recipients of the Chancellor's Distinguished Fellowship receive a $10,000 annual fellowship added to their appointment stipend with full tuition and fees paid. This is extraordinarily competitive and matches the top awards from the National Science Foundation. We are seeing results. The number of our PhD students has increased by 21% since 2012. We are on target to meet our goal by 2020 which will mean an increase of 200 to 400 additional doctoral students from our baseline of 517 PhD students in 2012. <coughs> and we are already, I think, uh, about at 630 at this point. So I was asked to discuss our outcomes with you today. I'm going to highlight just a few areas, but you can see more details in the fact sheet that we've pre provided in your packet. US News and World Report ranked us number three among public universities' uh, online graduate information technology programs. So number three and sixth overall, if you include privates. Our Career Opportunities and Employer Relations Group is ranked 15th in the nation by the Princeton Review. Once again, College Factual and USA Today named our engineering programs the third best in the country for the third consecutive year. And we continue to be in very good company. We are right below Georgia Tech and right above MIT. In addition, we recently surveyed employers who hired our students over the past fiscal year. And 100% reported that they were satisfied or highly satisfied with the students they hired. 100%. So that is very, very encouraging. And we have now set our goal at 100%. Another measure in which we have good results is our average starting salaries. Our undergraduates, on average, are now making nearly $62,000 when they graduate from Missouri S&T. Our graduate students now command, on average, starting salaries of nearly $77,000. And that 
is 5,000 more than just last year alone. This makes us first in Missouri among public and private universities for average starting salaries, eighth in the nation among public universities, and 22nd in the nation among both public and private universities. And just last week, we were ranked by payscale.com as the eighth best institution nationally for ROI, return on investment, sixth best among publics, and first in Missouri by far. So I've told you about some of our successes, and successes that, that are fundamentally transforming this university, also contributing to the stature of the University of Missouri system and progress being made in the state of Missouri as well. And so let me touch on some of the challenges that we're facing. And, and these may be similar challenges that are occurring uh, uh, elsewhere as well. I would say that our three greatest challenges are capital constraints, deferred maintenance, and declining state appropriations. We used to have faculty on this list, if people might remember, but we've continued to make great progress in building up our faculty. Um, so that, that's, we know we're going to meet those goals. These are some other goals that are much more challenging at this point. All of these goals, as you see, um, are linked to finances. Throughout the nation, higher education is at a crossroads due to shrinking budgets and increasing expectations. And of course, you're familiar with the financial challenges that face our University of Missouri system. We are fortunate at Missouri S&T in recent years to have experienced a record enrollment, but um, make no mistake, the, the state's current and projected withholdings are significantly impacting us. Since 2000, we have nearly doubled our enrollments while state support has declined. And last year, uh, we actually saw the, the first year of state investing in capital in over a decade. And that, that investment is already making a huge difference on this campus. For example, when I spoke with you last spring, I mentioned our plan to expand the Advanced Construction and Materials Lab, which is vital to our strategic plan. We have already secured over $3.2 million in private support for uh, that project, and we were hoping to get a match for funding through the state's 50-50 program last year. Um, that did not occur. And that project is, is back on the table for this year. Un unfortunately, uh, it, it may be that the state will not be able to uh, match that funding again. And, and so that's just one example of a financial strain that we are experiencing. It, that project uh, really fits a very important need and would provide uh, this institution with the best facility in the nation to look at sustainable infrastructure. We are a community of innovators. And uh, I think you, you might want to know how we are responding to these challenges here at Missouri S&T. We are significantly realigning our budgets and we are guided by an overarching philosophy as we are doing so. We must preserve the academic core of our institution to the greatest extent possible. And at the same time, we need to not only preserve our revenue streams, but, but we need to expand and diversify those revenue streams. And we will continue to move forward strategically with investments where they are needed to continue to move us toward our 2020 goals. Again, we are creative and um, also with a university that uh, is, has a legacy in science and technology, um, we need to continue to look to, for ways to improve and become more efficient and effective with the resources that we do have. So that's imperative 
for Missouri S&T's continued success. Yet, we are at a crossroads. And the combination of nearly doubling in size since 2000, declining state support, and a cap on tuition that really threatens the quality that we are known for and recognized for. Additionally, our graduates are vital to the economic well-being of the state of Missouri and also of the nation. So big challenges here, not unsurmountable, um, but, but we need everybody thinking very creatively and in innovative ways to help us continue to move forward. And so as you can see, Missouri S&T is at a, a pivotal point in our nearly 150 year history. And we have tremendous momentum. We do need your help, your advocacy, to lead the state of Missouri to economic vitality. And so I just want to thank you for your time and attention. And at this point, I'd be very happy to entertain any questions you might have. Thank you, uh, Chancellor Schrader. Uh, questions from the board? I do have. Uh, John. You, uh, you've made uh, progress, and I know that one of your priorities is uh, student housing. Last year at our lunch, we heard from the students that that's one of the limitations that we have on this campus. Um, and one of the ideas that was floated was public-private partnerships. Uh, how much progress have we made in the last year, and do you see that as being an avenue that can be explored? Because your successes, and you, you are to be congratulated on moving this campus to the next level, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing to be successful and to have more students, uh, but we have to have housing. So a little bit more about what's been done and how you see the future uh, well, Curator Phillips, you, you are exactly right in what we heard from our students last year. They were focused on um, housing and dining options. And this year we spent a good deal of time looking into both of those. And so you'll be pleased to know that there's a Starbucks in the library and an Aubon Pen um, and a Zatar Mediterranean uh, food um, um, kiosk that that didn't exist be before then. So we're continuing to look at the, the dining options. Um, we were able to open this fall semester a new 450 bed residential uh, commons, university commons uh, facility, uh, and the students are very, very pleased with what that is able to offer them. That uh, meets the needs that we have for the moment. Um, in addition, many of our fraternities and sororities are undergoing some dramatic renovations and new building. And so they are helping us grow the capacity as well for uh, wonderful housing options. And in addition, we are leasing a number of buildings in downtown Rolla. Um, and the students in particular enjoy that and our students participate in the downtown business association meetings and the community loves the fact that the students are there um, and there's been an uptick uh, in, in uh, some of the businesses downtown as well. So, so we're going at this at a, a number of different ways. Um, many of you may remember that we have a two-year live-in rule. Freshmen and sophomores have to live in campus-approved housing. Um, and that includes, of course, any of the, the residential halls and lease facilities where we provide um, residential programming as well. It, uh, it also includes the fraternities, the sororities, the Campus Christian Fellowship, and, and other approved housing. Um, and that has a direct impact on retention, so much so that uh, typically you would see a 10 to 15 percent increase in retention with a freshman sophomore live-in. Does that help answer your question? It's a very good answer and uh, again congratulations on the changes that you've brought about on campus. You've been appreciated. Well thank you. I guess I, I failed to mention that we are exploring public-private partnerships particularly along Pine Street where we would have um, retail on the first level and then housing above. Uh, and, and as you'll see with the campus master plan, we're making some great progress on defining our campus uh, and, and also being able to move forward with 
uh, providing that best support uh, and, and uh, um, experience for our students. Any other board member have a question, comment? If not, I'd like to call on President Choi. Well, Chancellor Schrader, on behalf of the University of Missouri system, I want to thank you, the faculty, students, staff, and members of your board of trustees for really developing an innovative strategic plan that did not sit on the shelf. You actually implemented it with resources. And we're very proud of the progress, and we wish you the best of success at Wright State. So thank you very much, Chancellor Schrader. Thank you very much. Turn now to uh, committees. First committee we're going to hear from will be uh, the Finance Committee, chaired by Curator Steelman, the members of which are Curator Chapman, Lehman, and Snowden. And uh, Curator Steelman, I know that you have it, uh, no action items, I don't believe, but have uh, uh, several important informational items. Uh, thank you. Uh, in a significant break with what we have done before, uh, a vote on tuition and fees will not occur today. It is, it is uh, traditionally done at this meeting. Uh, the fact that it's not occurring today, uh, Ryan uh, Rapp will be happy to talk about, but it is a recognition of some of the challenges and opportunities we have. Despite the fact that we have no action items and only five information items, the chair has very graciously set aside a significant period of time. And the reason for this time is that Ryan is prepared to answer some, some significant questions about how we proceed, the options on how we proceed in recognizing what Chancellor Schrader has said. We have challenges and opportunities. We need investment from the state, but we also have to investigate other options. And that's the reason for the time and the discussion. Now, at this time, uh, Interim Vice President Ryan Rapp will review the University of Missouri System fiscal year 2018 uh, tuition and required fees. Good morning and thank you, Curator Steelman. Today I'll review, as he noted, several information items, uh, the, the first of which is our proposed increase for tuition and required fees on our four campuses. We plan to bring these back to the board for approval at a special meeting in May. As we all know, we're facing significant budgetary challenges. The modest increases proposed will allow us to stand by our commitment to a high quality yet affordable education for our student. students. The proposed increases that we're presenting today are estimated to provide an additional $14.4 million to the university. On this particular chart, uh, this is the proposed increases uh, con that were contained in the mailing materials. We're proposing an increase for Missouri undergraduates, undergraduate rates by CPI, which is 2.1%. Of the 14.4 I mentioned, this would provide $4.5 million in increased tuition revenue to the university. Just for some background, the Higher Education Act, or as we commonly refer to it, Senate Bill 389, limits the increase to Missouri undergraduate tuition and required fees charged all students to CPI. This typically includes our tuition and required fees. Uh, when we talk about required fees, think of things like our IT or student services fees. It does exclude those fees that are not, that were passed by a student vote. So if we have a student referendum on a specific required fee, it is excluded from the statute. Increases above CPI may be allowed, but have to be approved by the Commissioner for Higher Education through a waiver process. And, and I just want to be clear with the, what we're proposing here. Um, this slide combines our Missouri undergraduate tuition and required fees and shows that our increases wouldn't exceed 2.1%. So it wouldn't require a waiver under Senate Bill, Bill 389. Um, just want to be really clear that with what we're proposing uh, with this, if we move forward, we wouldn't be required to submit a waiver. This slide, though, provides the increases that we're proposing for our other students. So it includes our non-resident and graduate students. As you can see, they range from 2.1 to 6%. It, 
and they would be estimated to provide six million in additional revenue to the university. 3.1 of that would come from non-resident undergraduate graduates and then two and a half million would come from our graduate programs. Then as we move to professional students, uh, as you can see, we have a, a range of increases here and they're based really on market analysis of the particular schools and their relationships to the campus strategic plans. We'd estimate the overall revenue provided from these increases would be 1.6 million. <coughs> so if you look at this chart, what it presents is the increase in required fees by the campuses charged on undergraduate fees and is demonstrating that we would be in compliance with Senate Bill 389. So these are the required fees I talked about, just like tuition for undergraduates for Missouri undergraduates, they're limited to CPI unless we go through a waiver process. The MU rate is above 2.1%, but that's due to a new student, student services enhancement fee that was voted on by a student referendum. So it is allowed to increase above CPI. I also want to just note quickly that UMSL does not have required fees. In 2014, they moved to roll their required fees into their tuition. So that's why you don't see, you see an A on the chart for UMSL. Um, these increases are only anticipated to provide 350000 in additional revenue to the university. So as we talk about tuition and required fees, we'll talk about supplemental fees here in a minute, but I just want to pause and say this concludes my presentation on this topic, and I'd welcome any questions the board might have. Any questions? If, if there are no questions on this, uh, Ryan will review the fiscal year 2018 supplemental and other related enrollment fees for the University of Missouri system. As we talked about tuition and required fees, these are supplemental fees. And, and I want to be really clear that these really only represent and provide 8% of our total tuition and fees. The proposed increases from our supplemental fees are estimated to provide approximately seven and a half million in increased revenue to the university. I also want to highlight that supplemental fees are assessed for enrollment in specific courses or specific programs. They are not subject to Senate Bill 389. The fees also go directly into the programs they support and are really critical to the success of those individual programs. The supplemental fees are also discussed with student groups across the various campuses. That's a requirement as part of the process when we review the supplemental fees submitted by the campus. And so as we developed and reviewed the proposal from the campuses, we had four broad categories that the, the increases fell into, with the first being that were increases that were phased in over multi-year. We previously discussed those fees with the board and the board has approved those. We then also have small increases in supplemental fees that would be limited to 2.1% to 5%. Um, then we do have some increases that are related to high cost programs and are really di driven by the program needs. Um, and then we have a couple fees that are new or either restructuring of currently, current fees. And I'll go over each of those. Uh, I also want to highlight that we did an analysis last year on the use of supplemental academic fees by major institutions for surrounding states. And it clearly showed that all institutions use some form of variable, variable tuition by college or school. Um, and in, in most cases, we found that institutions had two or, two or three different types of inst differential tuition or supplemental fees that they were utilizing. So I just want to highlight that we've also looked at what neighboring states are doing in this area. So for the, the, the first uh, category related to multi-year increases that we previously discussed with the board, um, the first is the final increase in the arts and science uh, fee for all 2000 level and above courses. This would bring the total fee to $40 per credit hour and would be the final increase. The second for the UMKC online course fee is the final year as well and would bring the total fee to $45 per credit hour. The last two are from Missouri S&T and are part of a plan that they brought to the board last year and would repre represent the second year of a three-year plan to double those fees over a three-year period. Uh, respectively, this year it would put those increases at $175 per credit hour and $84 per credit hour. So this is our largest category of supplemental fees, which we're calling just increases for cost to continue. And as I've highlighted, they range from 
typically 2.1% to 5%. Um, with the exception of the fees we're discussing in the other categories, um, most are increasing by 2 to 3%, uh, with the exception of UMKC. Uh, specifically at MU, the increases are 3%, except for those that we've specifically identified. Um, UMKC is proposing a 5% increase for most of their fees, which this does include their high cost, high demand programs as well. Um, S&T, as we've already noted, they only have two supplemental fees, and we talked about those on the prior chart. Um, UMSL remains flat on some of their fees, or going up by CPI. In addition to, well, as we'll talk on the other slide, they have some high cost programs where they're looking to increase those fees above 5%. So as we think about our high cost programs and increases that are more than 5%, um, it's primarily related to our business, engineering, and nursing programs. MU is recommending a 9.5% increase to the undergraduate and graduate fee for the True Last College of Business. This would bring the total fees to $92 and $108 per credit hour, respectively. This will allow the True Last College of Business to hire and retain faculty and also help improve faculty to student ratios, which is critical for the college. Um, MU Engineering is similar, and it will be used to hire new faculty, space renovation, and also purchase research lab equipment. Uh, UMSL has many of the same drivers um, that MU does, but additionally, their fee increases are driven by a comprehensive cost and market study that they have done this year. So one of the things that UMSL did this year was they really looked at the cost to deliver these programs and then what the market for those look like. And so where they're looking to have some fairly significant increases as a percentage, it's really informed by the cost to deliver those programs. And then also what does it look like from a market perspective in St. Louis for those programs. And then the, the final set of fees, supplemental fees that we're talking about is really changes in new or new fees and, and restructuring. Um, the first at UMKC is a new nursing simulation course fee to support hardware and software maintenance for the nursing simulation lab. I, I think as we've reviewed this, it's critical to the clinical experience for the students and will allow for increased usage of the simulation lab. The second is just a restructuring of, of the social work fee and is not actually anticipated to have any financial increase or cost of the students but just simply restructuring the fee. The last is, is related to UMSL and their nursing program is really transitioning away from the fees they had related to their MSN nursing graduate program, which will be phased out um, over a period of time to move to their doctor, doctor of nursing practice. And so really looking to replace that fee with this. It won't impact the current students in the master's program. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that it, this is really a transition, um, not really a fee increase to a new fee structure. With that, I'd welcome any questions the board might have on these proposed increases, and we would plan to bring these to a special board meeting in May for approval. Questions or comments? And I, if Curator Phillips doesn't start talking about differential tuition, I'll, I'll be forced to. <laughs> I, I thought it, it was called something differently here, variable. <laughs> So I thought we'd touched on it and it's still understudy. Is that right? That, that, that's basically correct. I want to ask some specific questions. And for new members of the board, Curator Phillips has always taken kind of a lead role in talking about what we often refer to as differential tuition, which is uh, recognizing the cost of high cost programs. Engineering comes to, uh, to mind, but, but there are others. Uh, and, and if you can, uh, Ryan, we use fees, which are kind of a de facto differential uh, tuition. I've had heard complaints from students on how they can put their, uh, how fees make it harder to put their financial aid packages together. Can you talk a little about long-term thoughts and what either uh, uh, mitigates in favor of or against uh, uh, something like Purdue does, for example, which I think is a $2,000 uh, per tuition or uh, semester increase in charges for engineering or Arizona State, which has a per semester upcharge for their business school, their honors college, and their engineering. Yeah, and I think in a lot of ways, we're doing things that are very similar if you look at our engineering uh, supplemental fees. I think the big question for us is, uh, should we be looking at moving away from 
the course fee and really moving to program fees where you'd be charging that on a per semester basis. Uh, I think that's something with our four campuses and with the president we're going to be looking closely at over this next year. And, and part of that is the feedback we've heard on, on how can we simplify the bill for the students, but then also acknowledging the need of for some of these high cost, high demand programs where we know we have the demand, it's just a cost issue of getting students into those programs. Uh, we need this revenue, but I, I think there is an opportunity there for us to maybe move away from the credit hour model to really thinking about how do we assess these fees at the program level. And in some cases, I think in one or two instances, we actually do assess the fee now at the program level. What do we as a board need to do, in your opinion, to move that discussion and investigation forward? I, I think hold us accountable over the next year to get that done. I mean, I think that's something um, that is top of mind for us, and, and I'd look for us to come back in the fall to discuss, not, not ask for any approval, but discuss with the board um, what our plans would be for how we might think about tuition differently going forward. Any other questions, comments? Well, that, that, that does open the door for discussion. And I hope uh, by fall that, that someone, whether it's you or a committee, will come back and, and give, uh, I, th I think you actually said that it's common and you've surveyed our surrounding states to have variable t tuition and fees. And I don't know whether that's our peer group or not, but. I would hope you would come back and, and have recommendations, whether it's uh, a program as opposed to hourly, uh, whether you promise no increases uh, uh, in the future. Um, but uh, it seems like there are a number of different avenues out there. And, and what drives me to this is you have students that are confused about the cost. In fact, we had students at maybe our last meeting that said, the fees that go up and, and they don't understand that when they first apply because it isn't easily sorted out in the admissions process. And I think we've recently had legislators who've been critical of our seeming to do an end run by some fee increases when we're supposed to be, it says, uh, uh, tuition and fees. And, and so um, we've talked about this for a year and a half and uh, uh, it'd be great to have something before we meet again having to approve tuition. So I, I, I agree with you. Um, I don't think we could have kind of what our new plan would be ready for May, but I think by this fall we'll be in a position to, to do that with President Choi coming on board. And we've already had people, we, we have been working on this, so it's, it's not a matter of today when we walk away from here and we say, well, we've got to get started on this. It is underway. I, I think one of the real challenges for us is as, as students and parents continue to pay for more and more of the cost of the education, um, what you're dealing with is you're going to want, to, I, I think you're going to see this nationally, there's going to be demand to pay at the program level for the cost of that education. So as a, as a student and parent that wants to be a history major going to be willing to pay a tuition that's subsidizing the cost of an engineering student. I mean, when, when state funding was providing nationally 70 to 80 percent of the cost of the education, that was a different discussion. But when, now that that's flipped, I think we're going to be forced, and I don't think it's just us, I think all of public higher education is going to be really looking at um, how do we price our tuition different, and I think the concept of having just one, one rate of tuition for all students to pay isn't something that's going to work. So I think it's critical, and I think it's critical that we are really thoughtful and get it right and also look at what others have been doing. Ryan, you know, that, uh, that, as has been pointed out, this is a critical issue for, for the university. And uh, our fall meeting is in the last week of September. Do you think that's a reasonable date to point toward where we could devote a considerable amount of that meeting to this very issue? Yes, that, that, that's what we've been thinking we would look to. Because that, that would get it out of this annual cycle of approving tuition, and then it could really inform what we would do then the next spring as it relates to this. Thank you. I uh, fully support uh, Curator Steelman uh, focusing on this issue. I, I do have one, uh, it's, it seems to me it's a complex issue, and few, if any, of the curators are ex expert in this. I know I'm not. Uh, but we talk about, well, engineering costs more. I mean, it, we know it costs more to educate an engineer 
particularly down here with experiential learning, which adds to the normal cost. Uh, but if you price it based on the cost of the program, uh, we may have fewer and not as qualified applicants because they can go to another state that isn't doing a cost analysis and engineers and other uh, uh, similar benefit the state. And when the state legislature looks at are we producing graduates that will benefit the state, engineering's got to be on the top of the list. You can't price this out of the market just because of the cost. So it's very complex. That, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the cost analysis is just one lens. Then you have to look at the market analysis and say, what does it do from a market standpoint? So it, it, if you just let the cost analysis drive it, um, you're not going to get to the right answer. Thanks. Ryan, I, this is, thank you all. This is my first meeting, so I'm sorry I'm jumping in here, but I appreciate all this information you put together. From my point of view, I, I would love to have just that. Who are our peers? Who is our market analysis that we're comparing ourselves to? And what does our, our base tuition look like comparatively? And then what do these suggested variable uh, rates do to us in the marketplace. I, I'd love to see that. To Certainly, and, and we could bring some of that information at the May meeting. Um, when we ask for this to be approved, we could give you an idea of what our peers are and what they look like. Uh, we have that available. Yes, sir. So differential tuition obviously is very important because we need to make sure that we provide the best education possible for students to apply to our programs. Just to give you an example, at the True Last School at Mizzou, the student to faculty ratio is over 100. To give you a sense of what that means, when you look at US News and World Report, the top university, the top 25 university, which is Rutgers, has a 12 to 1 overall student to faculty ratio. So it's a terrific program, but by not being able to provide more resources to the True Last School, the students will not be able to get the type of education that they deserve because there are not enough faculty members. And at SNT, because it's so heavily experientially focused, if we are training our students in substandard laboratories or without the latest and greatest equipment, we are not meeting our obligations. And as we'll share in, uh, in May, we are very competitive. Uh, but the fact that we have Senate Bill 389 that limits our ability to actually test the market. We need to test the market. But that means that higher prices or tuition doesn't necessarily represent higher cost of education because there are families that can still afford that higher tuition. But what that does is that we can have a hold back on the tuition to provide more need-based aid to those students who deserve it. So it's a very complex model, but it's a model that we can't test because of the limitations of 389. So as we move forward, we will bring you pros and cons of 389 and differential tuition. But that's a very uh, much needed discussion that we need to have as a board. Any other questions? If I might elaborate for just a second on, on what Dr. Choi said, because we talk about the high cost John, but there are also programs that families and students have indicated that they would love to pay for if they're offered uh, honors, a true honors college is an example, and there are, are uh, uh, universities which have been able to implement that and use that, and it also has provided not only those students the type of education they want, but has provided funds that are useful elsewhere, such as for uh, Pell Grant eligible students and things like that, so it's really a critical issue. The reason I am, and, and I pushed you a little bit, Curator Phillips, to talk about it, those of us who've been on the board know that this discussion's been ongoing for some time, and that we are somewhat frustrated that it seems to have disappeared at a time that all of us recognize the leading institutions are doing it. We haven't had a, a permanent, stable leadership. We do now, and, and Ryan, I hope that we really put an effort and Chair, Mr. Chairman into the retreats and other things to get the data that Curator Farmer has asked and to move forward on this. Yeah, well said, Curator Steelman. A absolutely, I, and I just highlight, um, for us, it, it's not just simply, I mean, we just can't simply say, well, we need more revenue. Um, it's we need more revenue and we also need to look at what we can do with our cost structure. I mean, I think it's, it's both, I'll, I'll talk about it later, but it's really looking at both sides of that ledger. Any other questions, comments? If, if not, uh, 
Ryan now will review the fiscal year 2019 preliminary state capital appropriations request and campus project plans. Uh, this is a, a critical uh, discussion of how we proceed and how we plan both Plan A, hopefully more state appropriations, and Plan B if it's not forthcoming. Thank you, Curator Steelman. Um, we annually review this with the capital needs and funding plans with the board. Um, before we get into the specific request, I, I want to set the stage a little bit and cover an overview of the capital needs in our planning process. And then I'll get into the preliminary state appropriation request and the campus capital plans. We have over $3.2 billion in capital assets on our balance sheet. That's almost half of the assets on our balance sheet. Um, th those capital assets have a current replacement value of almost $9.4 billion. Um, so by any measure, um, our buildings are ve a very significant and important part of the university. In, in many ways, um, the buildings and infrastructure help define the university. They play a key role in our recruitment of students and faculty. They also direct, directly support our academic and research programs. As we go through the discussion today, I, I hope we can all agree that we are going to have to think differently about funding our capital plans and the utilization of our current space. So on this chart, it's just providing um, an overview of our space. We have over 30 million um, square feet as it relates to space. I mean, when we layer in the Ag Experiment Station, the, the replacement value actually climbs to $9.5 billion. We talk about ENG and non-ENG. When I say ENG, um, we're talking about education in general space. Uh, this includes those buildings that are funded from the General Operating Fund, or as some of you board, have, have, we've talked about our green bucket of funding. Um, it's also where most of our academic and research buildings are housed, including our administrative buildings. When we talk about non-ENG, it's really our auxiliary spaces. So think of things like the hospital, residential life, athletics. And many of these buildings are funded by debt or gifts. Um, in, in many cases, our, our auxiliaries can utilize their funding streams, the various revenue sources they have, and pledge those as part of our system facilities revenue bonds. So that's, when you look at the non-ENG space, that's where much of our debt is held as it relates to those buildings. For this, though, what I really want to focus on is our academic and research buildings, our, our ENG facilities. Um, as you can see from this graph, um, the majority of our space is quite old. 78% um, was constructed over 25 years ago, so that's the two um, red bars on the far right. Um, and then when we think about, well, what's been renovated, 68% of that space has not been renovated in the last 25 years, and that's represented by the blue bars on the chart. So in 2008, um, as we faced funding challenge in the early, decade, early part of the 2000s, um, we did hire a building assessment firm, ISEIS, uh, ISIS, um, to evaluate our buildings. Uh, they came in, they inspected the buildings and determined the needs for that building. So this was for our ENG space, for our academic and research buildings. They looked at all of our system components, uh, inspected, and came up with a dollar value for each, um, as well as a timeline of when each item would need to be replaced. They then built a database, um, and that had our, what our facilities' needs were. Um, then they looked at what would be the replacement cost for those buildings. Um, and then that's what you get to what we call the facilities conditions need index or FCNI. It's really the facilities needs divided by the replacement value of the building. The closer to zero that, that ratio is, the better shape the building's in. So this, so you say, well, what does our FCNI look like? Um, as you break it down, I'll just go over this, this chart on the bottom. If it's a 0.1 or less, it's basically an excellent condition, you move out to point 0.1, point 0.2, it's good condition, then as, as, you move, as you get closer to one, the, the building becomes in poorer and poorer condition. 37% um, of our space is in the first two categories of excellent or good, but at the same time, 42% of our space is below average or worse, so it has an FCNI of 0.301 or higher. Um, and then if you look at the bar charts, it's just to give you an idea of that space that's at a point 
301 or higher. And, and you can see it is varied by campus. But for all of our campuses, we have significant challenges when it comes to our buildings. And then I think we've commonly talked about the $1.6 billion backlog that this represents. And I think it's really important that we understand what is in that backlog, because that's a really big number. And I think you have to start to think about, well, how, how do you break that down? Um, priority one, as you can see, is 52.7 million. And those are basically needs that need to be completed now or should have been completed yesterday. Priority two are those things that we should be doing within one year. That's 148 million. Uh, priority three are things that really are over a two to five year time horizon. As you can see, that's our largest cost. It's a billion, billion dollars. Um, and then as you move into priority four, those are things that are necessary that we need to be thinking about over the next six to 10 years. to kind of think about what builds on this backlog, um, what we want to look at is what is our maintenance and repair spend been for our buildings. Um, the blue bars represents the recurring dedicated funding we have to maintenance and repair. Um, and then the green bars are really one-time funds that we've had to invest into maintenance and repair. So those vary by year. Um, the dotted line shows what the FCNI will continue to to grow at if we do nothing. And, and we're not gonna do nothing, but it's just to present what that might look like if, if we didn't do anything about this. Um, and then with the red line, we're just showing this would be the target that we'd need to get to um, if we wanted to maintain an FCNI of 0.3. So basically, that line shows if we just wanted to maintain where we're at in terms of the conditions of our buildings, that's the funding level we would need to be at. You look at this table, what we're looking at is where is our current FCNI, and we want to target a point, point three or lower is where we want to be for the campuses. As you can see, MU, S&T, and UNKC all have a fair rating. Uh, OMSL's average rating is below average at 0.35. Um, but at the same time, MU and UMKC will be moving below a 0.3 by next year, most likely. Um, and, and then in 10 years, the average condition of the three, three of the campuses will be poor based on the current MNR funding levels. That actually means we go from being below 0.3 to being below 0.5. Um, and just for reference, when we ask ISIS where are other similar institutions at, um, I think on average, they're saying most institutions are at a 0.24. So as you can see, s and is really the only one that's well within that range. So, so we are behind other institutions, just for frame of reference. Not only did we want to look at what our building needs were, but then also we asked ourselves, um, after years of underfunding our facilities um, and really having more space than we can afford to maintain, uh, how could we start to evaluate how we're utilizing our space? Um, so we started to look at our space utilization what our usage patterns were. We've also benchmarked that to other similar campuses. And really what we're finding out through our space utilization studies is, is quite interesting. Um, and I want to be really clear, our required square footage is, is based on the number of students, faculty, and staff. That, that's how they arrived at their numbers. But uh, some, of the, some of the things that they found I think are quite interesting. Um, we're, we're close to the benchmarks in some cases. Uh, but in other cases, we clearly have opportunities. Uh, the benchmark for classroom usage is 35 hours per week. We range between 24 and 27 hours per week, which would point to we can do a better job of utilizing the current classroom space we have. Um, and then when we looked at class labs, it was 18 hours per week. We were closer in some cases on some campuses. We ranged from 10 to 17 hours per week when it came to labs. Um, and then we looked at research space per square footage, and I think this is really interesting. Um, many of our research disciplines had low research funding for the amount of space they had. So, so on a per square foot basis, it was low. Um, it would be easy to say, well, we just need to push more research into that space. I think we're going to have to look a little deeper, because I think part of that could be that maybe some of the research space we have isn't at the level it needs to be to attract um, the research faculty and the research dollars we need. So it, it could as much be that we have some of the research space we have isn't, isn't great research space, so it's harder to utilize. So I think it's not just as simple as putting more research into that space. I think that's one thing we want to do, but also then does, really- Does there need to be more study in that area? Yes, that 
Yeah. Seems that it would be very important. Correct. What's the quality of the research space? I'm sure the square footage may be sufficient, but the quality of the space. That, that, that's, that's what we need to look at. And I think that's one of our challenges is it looks like, well, we could be more efficient with our research space, but part of it is I th we suspect that the quality of our space is not great. Is, is, is there a plan to, uh, to do that? Yes, yeah. Would that be why it's underutilized? Yeah, that, that's part, part, that, that could be part of it. It's not just simply that we need to put more research dollars in the current space we have. Um, some of the research space we have may not be of the quality. Because what we've been hearing the last couple of years is that we need more lab space. We need more quality lab space. We need, I, I would submit that we probably need to retire some of our old outdated space or renovate some of our old outdated space. It's not necessarily more space, but maybe less space that's of higher quality. Can, can I just for a second, I want to direct uh, this as a question to Dr. Choi, who is not only uh, the president, but an experienced academic researcher. And when I first got on the board, we had research space at the bottom of Shrank Hall, and in a tour, we went down to the basement where there was a piece of equipment that cost almost a million dollars that was up on wooden blocks because the basement leaked. What does that do to our ability to attract the best and the brightest and the most experienced researchers? That's very detrimental. And many of the top faculty members have a lot of options. And if they were to come see some of our facilities, some of our facilities like what's in Shrink Hall or what's at UMKC and UMSO, they're going to say that they have other options, whether it's Purdue, Iowa, or Illinois. And our chancellors and provosts have done a wonderful job to make sure that they put as much resources into renovating some of those spaces. But we do need new research space that, is, that, is, um, that will enable our faculty members to be more productive in research. And uh, not only will we not be able to recruit faculty, we are going to lose faculty members to other institutions and our ability to attract the top graduate students will also be limited. So it is a very, very critical issue for all of us. And what I'm, Curator Snowden, parenthetically, the point is we may call it research space, but if it can't be utilized to get the researchers in that we want, it, it's useless to us. You could use it, but I can't, right? <laughs> well, well in my business, I could, I, I could utilize the leaky basement, but. <laughs> So, so to Chairman Graham's point as far as what our plan is and next steps, um, I, I think some of the things we have to think about is, as we know we're going to be challenged for funding and we're going to have to think differently, um, the, the benchmarks are great, uh, but, but we also know that we've got to come up with a plan where we're going to exceed the benchmarks for uh, space utilization. So simply just meeting the benchmarks when it comes to our utilization of classroom space isn't enough. We're going to have to do better. Uh, the other thing, too, to what we've already discussed is we're going to have to set metrics uh, for the utilization of our research space and the quality of the research being done in those spaces. Uh, one of the other things I think we have to think about is setting a, a net zero policy for space. Um, we have more space than we need. Uh, it's maybe not of the quality that we need, but I, I think we have to really be able to say that we're not going to be adding additional space without removing existing space. Uh, maybe with the exception of if we can find space that has a new funding stream to support it. Because uh, I, I know many times we, get, we talk about the cost of building, constructing the building. Um, the harder cost for us to fund is the ongoing cost of that building. It actually costs significantly more than it does um, to actually build the building. So over the long, the long run, the, the cost that we really have to find is how do we then continue to operate the building. And one of the ways to do that is take old buildings uh, that, that don't need to be renovated but simply torn down offline. And, and then I think we also have to think about how can we increase funding for facilities needs. And, and we'll talk about here in a couple slides on, on how we might go about doing that. And I don't think there's any one solution. I think it's going to be multiple things that we have to think about. Um, so as we dive into the, the funding, um, a little more of this. I, I think we, we can continue and want to continue to work with the state, but we also have to be willing to think about what are the things we can do with or without state support. Um, we do need recurring funding streams, um, and we know that 
our current model is limited. But I think if we think about a couple of different options, uh, we, we could have the ability to meet those needs. And, and some of that's just reallocation of funding. Uh, being willing to think about how our auxiliaries and other stream, uh, you know, other areas um, can provide money uh, into our academic and research buildings. Um, I think fundraising is another thing we have to think about is how can we fundraise for capital needs. And, and we'll talk in more depth on another slide. We've talked with the board at previous meetings about considering a capital renewal fee and what that might provide to us. Uh, we also have the central bank structure that I think can continue to provide um, substantial funding for capital investment. And then we need to be willing to think about industry partnerships uh, and also public-private pri partnerships as well. Um, I think if you look at some of the things, a place like Ohio State, um, where they've really looked at monetizing some of what they would deem their non-strategic assets, I think, um, for those of you that don't know, I think they, they sold their parking garages several years ago. I think it was a little over $450 million that that provided. So th those are the types of things that I think over the course of this next year we're going to have to be thinking about because as we step back and look at this, uh, it's critical that we find new ways to address our capital needs. Um, I, I think staying on our, on our same path that we're currently on is just not sustainable. So we really are going to have to challenge ourselves uh, to think differently about how we fund our academic and research space. Would you explain briefly what you mean by central bank structure that could <clears throat> Yeah, so, so um, we have a central bank structure that manages, and, and we can get into more depth. Uh, I'd be happy to just, just, just real to quick. Uh, it manages our external debt and our cash management, and if, if our investment returns are strong on our cash, it has the ability to generate a dividend at the end of the year um, that could then be used for capital needs. I have a question about, you mentioned that we've got, as far as buildings we own, we're, you know, we've got plenty that are underutilized. Do we lease, is there, is there a substantial amount of buildings we lease or any at all that maybe should be moved to the buildings we own? I don't think, I'm looking at Beth, I don't think we have any significant leases. Um, I mean, we do have some off-campus buildings. I could get you very specific details if you were interested on, on what our leases look like. Uh, we do keep track of that information, but it's not a significant part of our portfolio. I would like to add to it, Cure to Layman, when we had our orientation, we learned a lot about the extension and all the different extension offices throughout the state. And without having any opinion, I'd like to know more if those are lease agreements or ownership stakes and assets that we might have that aren't being fully utilized. I, I, I will get back with you on that, but I, I believe the county actually owns most of the space they're in. Um, I don't think those are actually buildings that we own or have a, necessarily a lease with, but, but we can get that answer for you. So we've talked a little bit about what a capital renewal fee might look like. We're not proposing it, we're just providing it as an information item and just really wanted the board to understand if we were to look at, let's say, a $30 per credit hour fee, what that would have the ability to generate. Uh, on an annual basis, we'd estimate uh, that it, it, it could generate approximately $43 million per year. Um, and, and we're really layering this on with the chart we showed earlier to give you an idea. It certainly doesn't address our entire need, but I think it could be a critical component in addressing some of our needs going forward. So it's really something that we're going to continue to look at and would look to bring back to the board at some point, but is, is something we want to highlight of this would be one way that we could start to address it. But if we simply said the only way we're going to address our capital challenges is through a capital renewal fee, it, it won't be enough. Um, but it, it's something we have to think about. Sorry, I'm going to ask another question. When coming up with these expenses and these funding needs, how do you run that bid process or estimate what these expenses are going to be? Um, so we, we usually work with a consultant. Um, we issue an RFP. They, they come in, and then we actually have a project consultant that comes in and helps us with the cost estimates, and, and I work close, Beth's here, um, our director of facilities, uh, her and I work closely. Uh, she does most of the work on that, but really working closely with a consultant to come up with the cost estimates on those. And then that is, the project plan is then brought to the board for approval. Can I ask one more question too? Could something like the capital renewal fee be dedicated stream of revenue to a bond where we could do some bond issuance and, and significant 
we, we could we, we could do some. I think we'd have to be very careful in how we go about doing that. I, if you took it all and took the entire thing and bonded against it, we'd probably have some challenges in the sense of we'd be right back where we're at uh, from the standpoint of we wouldn't have any recurring funding to address M and R needs. But I think uh, we could think about using some of it for bonding. But I, I think that's just something we'd have to be careful about. Uh, but yes, you could you could do some bonding against it. As our state has moved to a right to work state, I think it would be interesting to maybe revisit some of those costs and put them out for competitive bid. Just a thought. Yeah, and, and I think all of ours currently go out for competitive bid. So uh, we, we don't bring anything forward that, that hasn't gone through the competitive bid process. But, and, and we can certainly walk through that in more detail with you. So as we, we transition now to, to what our capital plans that we're considering for the next year, I just wanted to provide this as context. Um, so we'll just kind of review what our capital planning process currently looks like. I, I just note that I think we're right now kind of in this space of where we're significantly rethinking how we're going to be doing that going forward. Um, but really, as part of our capital plans, it inclu includes our state appropriation requests, the 50-50 projects that we submit to the state. Um, all planned projects that are greater than $5 million, and then any project that's debt funded comes before the board. And then at the end of it, there is a long-range plan, and I think we're going to have to look at how we rethink our long-range plans as well. Um, when we look at capital projects, and I, I think we're going to have to have a renewed focus on this moving forward, um, we, we do actually have a process where we set priorities around this. The program plan is important, and that really is the degree to which the project directly supports the campus's programmatic goals. How does it tie in with their strategic plan? Uh, facilities renewal, we've talked about that already, but it's really how does it reuse and improve upon existing space and help us address our FC&I? Uh, the other thing we look at is infrastructure and functional sustainability. So this is how does it support the existing campus infrastructure, uh, improve our energy efficiency and campus sustainability. We also look at is there external funding support for it. That's something we consider. Uh, really importantly, we also want to understand what the operating cost support is. Do we have the, do we actually have the ongoing cost to, to operate the building? And then we also want to understand what the state and regional economic impact is when we look at these projects. <clears throat> And, and typically for most projects, we want a planning and program study that's actually done. Um, and and it, it really develops the justification for the needed improvements or expanded facility. Uh, it also looks at alternative solutions and comes up with a strategy of how it will fit into the campus's overall master plan. Um, and, and really, it isn't just quantitatively driven, but we want to look at qualitatively also, how does it address identified needs in particular programs. So with that, um, what I'll go over was the next couple of slides, and it was in your mailing materials, is what our preliminary plans are for next year. Um, MU is really rethinking its approach, and, and I, I know Vice Chancellor Gary Ward will have more detail when he presents an updated master plan to the board in June. Keep in mind the board has to approve each campus's master plan. You'll, you'll see S&Ts later today. Every three years, the campus master plans come back before the board for approval. Um, just as MU is really thinking about how do they have a redevelopment for their research and education buildings on their campus. MU has 40 buildings or 30 percent of their academic and research space that's classified with an FCNI of 0.4 or higher. Um, you know, I, I think individually each of these facilities is in need of major renovation or replacement in some cases. Um, and, and, and Gary's been leading a process on the campus, and I think they've been looking at this through four main tenets. Um, when they look at these buildings and what they might do with them is, one is, is how does it support the academic mission? Does it improve the quality and efficiency of the research space we have? Does it reduce the facilities need and slow our growth in FC&I? And, um, and then also, how can we reduce our space requirements through the use of technology? Um, and also then looking at new space allocation models. So I, I really think, um, they're continuing to build this out, but this plan really fits with what we've discussed in the previous slide of this is something they're really focusing on over the next year. Um, and, and the phase one that they're proposing, I, th I think there's five buildings that they're proposing for the 100 million. They currently have a combined FCNI of 0.48. Uh, 
and if if we were able to do something like that, it would have the ability to eliminate 37 million in facilities needs. So that's what we're really looking for: is is how do how do we really wrap things around these four tenets that we've discussed? And uh, Gary will have much more detail at the June meeting as far as as what they're looking to do in that space. This is just showing what the preliminary capital plan for UMKC is. The, the phase two renovations for Spencer Chemistry will address deferred maintenance, uh, research and teaching space, and other deficiencies that we weren't able to accomplish with phase one. Uh, keep in mind this building I think was built in 1968 and until we started the phase one renovation there had been no significant renovation since the 80s. Um, the second item is the downtown campus for the arts. It would include a new 165,000 square foot facility with teaching, studio and office support spaces, and would be across the street from the Kaufman Performing Arts Center. Uh, this project fits with the uh, six primary goals, strategic plan of the campus to excel at the visual and performing arts. Uh, the last, uh, last project's really important as it relates to the School of Computing Engineering. I think what UMKC is trying to do here is incorporate some of the plans from the Robert E. Plaster Free Enterprise Center that, that we tried to get funding for and I think will allow them to, to move forward and provide uh, larger instruction labs and research space for the School of Computing Engineering. And I won't spend a ton of time because I know Chancellor Schrader is going to touch on some of this with her, her master plan update, um, but I would just highlight for S&T, uh, we talked about Shrank Hall, this is the third phase in addition of that renovation. Uh, it'll provide much needed teaching and research laboratories. Um, I think you got to keep in mind almost every undergraduate student on this campus is required to take a class in either chemical or biological sciences. And, and then the, the materials lab expansion, um, it'll provide increased research lab space um, and allows the faculty to engage in new research activities that are critical to addressing the facilities and infrastructure needs of the state and nation. When we look at the ERL addition and renovation, it'll create a unified research center that will provide additional interdisciplinary research space. Uh, the library project, I think, is really important for this campus as well, as it really will touch all students, faculty, and staff. Um, and then the Student Design Center expansion will uh, provide the campus with the increased ability to add a, an addition of five to seven multidisciplinary student-managed teams to be able to get that done. And then as, as we've already, well, I'm one slide ahead, um, S&T also has uh, some buildings they're considering in addition to their academic and research space. Um, they are considering the addition of a student fitness center, renovating and expanding the Havener Center that we're in today. Uh, keep in mind this was built, I think, in 2006, the time frame, and our enrollment has significantly increased since then, and then also updates to its current recreational complex. Um, as we previously noted with, with OMSL, um, they, they actually, not that we don't all have more space than we need, but, but through the studies, they, they have more space than they need and they have a space consolidation project that they're looking to execute on. Um, so as compared to their peers, they have more space than they need. They're really looking to reduce the occupied square footage. Um, a project like this would reduce their facilities needs by 13.2 million and it also would reduce the annual operating cost by almost 290,000. Um, Stadler Hall, the other project on here was built in 1967 and is, need of, is in need of significant reno renovation. Its current FCNI is 0.53, so it's, in that, it's already in that poor category. Um, and it would eliminate an additional 25.3 million in facilities needs for the campus. So these are just the preliminary projects that we would plan to submit to the state after the board approves in June. And as we discuss, and we've discussed these on the prior slides, I just highlight we're still reviewing these and they may be adjusted prior to the June meeting, but these are the projects that we're currently considering and they were included in the mailing materials. Then as we think about the 50-50 match programs, I'd, I'd apply the same principle to that. Um, they would be brought back to the June meeting for approval. Um, and it, we've discussed these on the prior slides. With that, that concludes my presentation on our capital plans, but I'd welcome any questions. 
great presentation. Lots of good information. A um, couple of questions. You mentioned public-private partnerships. Um, I think that's a good way to go. Um, I would prefer that over any type of a fee increase where we have our students pay more. Um, how aggressive um, are we pursuing these type of partnerships? And um, what are the results, if any, from trying to um, secure these type of partnerships? So I, I think we're probably still in the exploratory phase of that. I think we're looking at what other institutions have done in this space. I mean, I think we've done some things at a smaller scale. We haven't done anything at the large scale. I, I think part of the challenge we have when we look at a public-private partnership is if it's just a financing vehicle for us and, and there's nothing else to get out of that, um, and we think we still have debt capacity, our cost of funds internally is, is sometimes lower. So that's something we have to consider. Um, but I, I think for us, um, public-private partnerships and then asset monetization, so if we look at some of these non-strategic assets, I think those are things that we're going to really have to think about doing over the, the course of this next year. But, but I can't sit in front of you today and say, here are the specific projects we're doing, other than I know we've done some on a very small scale. Um, but I think what we really now have to say is, are we willing to look at this on the much larger scale? Another question, you talked about reallocation of money. Um, from the university to, you know, f um, fund this. What would be the targets, um, the targeted areas where you would reallocate money from? Well, I think that's um, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I I don't know specifically what we'd look at. One of the things we think about is for our auxiliary operations. Um, if they're just simply a tub on their own bottom, I think the question is, is that really enough? Um, they ought to be able to provide, and sometimes it's not in the form of uh, money, but they ought to be able to provide some additional return over in addition to just being self-sustaining. So the, the question is, can we look at our auxiliary enterprises and do they have the ability to provide any type of resource or funding for our academic and research buildings? In addition, now we have to be careful because they need to be able to fund their own building needs as well, but I think the question you have to ask is, um, they certainly need to be able to provide some benefit to the university, or, or, you, or you start to look at those, and, and those might be the types of assets you'd look at to say, um, is that something we'd want to explore at least a public-private partnership, or could we monetize those assets? Uh, so I think those are things we'll have to think about. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Curator Phillips, you look like you're poised. Uh, I, I was going to ask if you could put up uh, slide 64 so that we could talk a little bit about prioritization. As I understand it, these are all under study and we're going to come back in June and, and maybe use what you're talking about, how to rank or prioritize. And I'm wondering how the 50-50 match fits into this because external funding support only counts for 15 percent. Somebody came up to me this morning here at S&T and said that there is a project that where they've raised I don't know, more than three million dollars and and it's ready for a, a match and uh, so are we applying that criteria so, so that uh, if this is the ranking of priority that that may not move forward because of applying this to something where funding is you're getting half of the cost paid. Yeah, I, I think um, what, why external funding support is only at 15% is um, we want to make sure the buildings that we're fundraising for actually fit with where we want to go as an institution. So it's really important. I mean, it, it, it's very important to us, but at the same time, if we have donors that you know, or we're fundraising for buildings that aren't part of our strategic plan, um, but, but certainly with the building you highlighted, I think it, it checks all those boxes. For us. Uh, so if it does fit within the strategic plan, both for the campus and the system, then it wouldn't it wouldn't be uh, placed down on the priority because of the of the uh, fifteen percent. Correct. I, I think what um, what we really have to think about over this next year, and we're we're planning around is um, we have so we can submit these projects to the state, and and we want to partner with the state where we can, but we also have to start to say for our highest priority projects. Um, we're willing to find different ways to get those projects done. Now, will we see all of the capital projects today that will be proposed in June? I ask that question because 
last year one appeared for the day that we had to approve it that I don't think I saw before and uh, I, I made a point of it. It had to do with uh, giving money to the med school in at MU and UMKC to I think pay Cerner. Yeah. Uh, which I thought was inappropriate. Why would we be doing that? Uh, so have we seen everything that will come forward in June? Yes, you've seen everything that potentially could come forward in June. We may be making some changes to those, um, but you would see those in the mailing materials before the June meeting. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Because I, I want to, I, I really am much more shy than what it looks like, by the way. Uh, because I, I thought Curator Phillips just asked the two most important questions going forward for this board and the challenges this board and the test of this board's ability to work collaboratively and together. And the first is prioritization. Uh, you, Curator Phillips, have always made a point of how our old practice was to say basically we wanted a whole bunch of money and then see how it sorted out. And in my opinion, one of the things that I'm asking Ryan to consider and to talk to the president about is the board becoming more active, not less active in prioritizations. Uh, the second thing is, is that the 50-50 projects, and, and this is almost <clears throat> heresy to talk about because we love to talk about them and they provided a source of funds, and I think we have to think very seriously whether that has been in the strategic interest of the university. And what it has done is we have built buildings because we could get somebody else to pay for them, 50% from philanthropy and 50% from the state. Those have not always been strategic decisions. In addition, I would question whether higher ed doesn't like to sometimes build buildings with other folks' money in a way that does not provide the discipline necessary to both prioritize that campus or the system's priority programs and projects and what's good for the state of Missouri and has allowed them to avoid the need to plan in the future for additional upkeep. So I hope as we move forward in this discussion that we discuss more how the board will both prioritize and whether our reliance upon 50-50s has really been in the best interest of the university. Well, I agree and it, it, it backs up to what is a campus seeking uh, because it may take, probably took a couple of years for whatever the project here is at S&T to get the $3 million. So I think we rely on the campuses to say, well, it's within our strategic plan and what we're developing, and then it needs strong leadership to coordinate to make sure that that fits within the, within the system's strategic plan. So I agree with you entirely. Unfortunately, uh, even though we're hopefully going to prioritize this time, that doesn't mean that the legislature accepts our prioritization. And more than that, we've learned that on occasion, uh, a governor can, can simply do the withholding on a line item basis. So, uh, and I don't know whether it has yet impacted approved 50-50, but uh, uh, it, it did, I think, with the Plaster Entrepreneurship Building in, at uh, Kansas City. Uh, thankfully, uh, the, the two major funders, the Plasters and uh, the Kauffman Center, uh, graciously allowed those funds to be, you, the, the private funds that had been raised, to go to the engineering building. So, uh, you know, God love them for doing that, but you can't expect that all the time. So this is, uh, this is hugely important, I think, for all the campuses to get their priorities straight and for us to understand them, not just on 50-50, that's just an example, but all the other priorities and with a sense of what's feasible in Jefferson City. And I don't know how you keep the legislature or the governor from when they take funds back from then again being able to line item things out that we've prioritized. That's a problem we can't solve here, I don't think. Mr. Chairman, as a further comment on what John said, you know, when things are good and we're making a lot of money and the state's flush, then they have a tendency then to kind of go along and approve some of these projects, which are the 50-50 or whatever. 
But when things go not quite so good, which is where we are right now, and revenues are down, I think the chances of the 50-50s moving forward have a less and less uh, chance of being funded. And, and it seems like that we really need not to rely on the 50-50 so much, but to look to other avenues to fund those projects. I, I was going to let someone else, but I'd, I'd put this to both Ryan and, and President Choi. And again, this is, this is kind of heresy. We want to keep alive the idea that the state of Missouri is going to make the investment in higher education that we think it is valuable. But we have a university to run, and there may be times where we can't simply wait on those state appropriations. Uh, there are avenues that you've talked about some of them. I'd like Ryan to explain some of them one more time, the things we can look at, and Dr. Choi to comment on that. So a as we move forward, I want to just share uh, this particular criteria. This is just a guideline, but that guideline is something that we use as an input along with the uh, input from the chancellors and the provost to identify what the priorities are. And I, I do agree that we greatly value donor support, but donor support really can't drive our strategic plan. Our strategic plan must drive donor support. And so I think we're going to be in a very good shape as we develop the future strategic plan for this university, but I can tell you right off the bat, it's not any different than what we talked about before, which is growing research, growing educational outcomes, and meeting our economic development needs. And those are gonna be very, very critical. And if we throw out there to the legislature 12 different 50-50 plans without any priorities, then we actually are leaving it up to them to select what our strategic plans are. So we have to prioritize that moving forward. But this is gonna take a lot of discussions. This is just a guideline. But the input from the chancellors and the campuses are gonna be very critical because they know the needs on their campus better than anyone. Let me put an ex ex exclamation point on that. Um, two, a year and a half or two years ago, one of the 50-50 matches that came out, we didn't have that many the first year, was to do essentially a wine bar in Columbia. I think it cost $3 million and the wine association put up half of it. And, and so that, that came up, you know, they had a match. Uh, I think we did not move that forward uh, to the legislature. At least it didn't get approved. Uh, and I don't think that was part of our core mission was to have a wine bar to, to teach entertainment about how you use wine. Although. I know you like wine and I do too. <laughs> so what we've talked about it is, uh, is in fact what we have done. Uh, unfortunately, the 50-50, uh, because of economic times, is not being given much weight by the legislature, but there will be a time when it is. Uh, but uh, I think everything that's been said is important, and our work between now and when we have to approve the budget and our own prioritization is very important. I'm glad that we're really going to pay attention to it this time. Mr. Chairman, we have other things, but I think if I could have just one more minute. Ryan, could you say again the possibilities? There's been a really real reluctance uh, by the university because we wanted state support sometimes to utilize some of our own assets. Let's say that we cannot get state support in the next two or three years, uh, and I don't think that I'm being wholly hypothetical when I say that. Again, what are the avenues that we as a board and the administration can consider to come up with those capital needs? Sure. Um, uh, as we step back, we, we've talked already about reallocation of funding. Um, then how can we really get a good capital plan that then can drive our fundraising efforts? I think those are things we can consider. Uh, we've talked about the capital renewal fee. Um, I think the central bank really does have the ability to provide some money to help us address capital needs. And then I, I think, uh, I'll, I'll just say industry partnerships, and that's really broad. Um, that, that could be P3 partnerships, that could be trying to find industry partners who are willing to actually invest equity in these buildings with us. Um, and then the last would be, I, I think we have to start to look at uh, institutions like Ohio State uh, that have, have moved some of their non-strategic assets have monetized those. Um, and I'd also, we, we heard a little bit at least uh, 
from some of our, our, our debt advisors on what University of Chicago did. Uh, I, I think even in challenging times several years ago, they, they, now they did it more traditionally, but I think it's the same mindset. If they borrowed over a, mil, a billion dollars uh, to invest into their academic buildings, and, and actually, at the same time, I think saw their credit rating slip, but it was because they felt it was the right thing to do for the strategic direction of the university. So I think those are things we're just going to have to really press ourselves on over the next year to think about. And I hope that my point, Curator <clears throat> Phillips, is if the state does not see matters the way that we do, maybe we should take a pro more proactive approach in taking uh, matters into our own hands. Great. Creator Steelman, I've got, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. I've got a quick one. So I appreciate the prioritization. My, my question is, and it's probably more for Ryan, but is our budgeting process closely linked to our strategic planning process? Yes. Um, could, I, I think um, on some campuses it's, it's better than others, and we're working on tightening that up. But historically, um, we, we are trying to do that. I think uh, we will be looking at uh, what I call our historical budget models and how do we move away from those into new budget models that really are driven by those plans. Um, but, but I can't give you just an answer of yes or no. I think it varies uh, by campus. I, I can say this, all of our campuses are really working on moving in that direction. Thank you. I had a, I had a question for President Choi. You know, we saw some data showing that, um, for instance, UMSL had some space that may be available. Have we um, talked to all the, all the system campuses just to say, hey, look, if you've got extra space, is there a way that another one of the campuses could utilize that space to, let's say, have a presence in St. Louis? Let's say to, um, we've got a great um, plant science industry in St. Louis. How do we get some of our MU faculty over there to utilize that space, and then we just don't have space sitting? Have we had a serious discussion amongst the chancellors at the, un at the universities um, to, to see if we can you know, turn that into a strand? Uh, we will today. Uh, I think that's very important. Um, all of the chancellors are very interested in collaboration. And one of, the, one of the key elements for us to grow as a system is to collaborate on research and educational programs. And as you may know, SNT has a very strong presence in St. Louis with their engineering program to serve the needs of Boeing and all of the large uh, industry partners that are in that region. But I would like to explore with all of the chancellors the possibility of bringing in more resources, especially with the Bear Monsanto merger that is in discussion to see how we can take the top plant sciences program in the world, which is at Mizzou, bring that to St. Louis. At the same time, if there are collaborations in engineering that can be had with UMSO, Mizzou, and SNT at the St. Louis campus, I think that would be terrific. Because we do have access space there. Not only there, but also, I believe, in some cases at UMKC, with, uh, with the exception of Hospital Hill. Thank you. Any further questions? Any further questions on, on this topic, which is state capital appropriations? Uh, Ryan will now review the endowment spending distribution and administrative fee analysis for the University of Missouri system. So I, I don't have a set of charts for this presentation. Uh, it, it's an information item. We were looking for feedback. Uh, we would plan to bring this back to the board uh, to consider as an action item at the June meeting. It is an analysis of our current endowment spending distribution and administrative fee. Uh, the proposal cha changes would increase the endowment administration fee from 1% to 1.25 beginning in FY18 while transitioning the spending distribution rate from 4.5% to 4% over a period of up to six years. If you look in your materials, there's additional detail regarding this proposal. As our funding mix continues to shift away from state support and enrollment flattens, we must continue to look for private funding sources. Endowments help fund needs like faculty, scholarship, and research efforts and will be critical to our success. Just since FY 2015, the endowment pool gifts have grown by 80 million. It will be important that we can invest additional resources in our development offices, and this increase will allow for that. This is all at the same time uh, our tuition and state support face significant pressure and need to be directed to the needs of students and faculty. 
This fee could provide an additional $2.1 million to the campus development efforts while not being a drag on our operating fund. I also highlight this fee is well within the range of peer institutions. For example, LSU is at, at 1.25 percent. Florida is currently at 1.35 percent. South Carolina and Mississippi State are both at 1.5 percent. So I just wanted to provide that as some context. I don't know why we're not comparing our fee to the top endowments in the country and what their fee is that they're charging their administration. We, we can certainly get that for you. I, I think we, we did look at some of the AAUs. Um, and they are comparable. Um, we'd be on the high end at one and a quarter. Yeah, that seems, I would like to investigate that a little bit further okay. if possible. What, what uh, group is doing this analysis? Who, how's this being done? We've been working with the campus development offices and, and Tom Richards and the tr uh, treasurer. Okay. Thank you. You could, you could save a lot more money uh, if you use more exchange traded funds and less active. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> well, we, we'll be talking about asset allocation in June. Uh, we'll, we'll have a, a lengthy discussion around that. Um, and, and then as we think about our spending distribution, um, we do have an obligation. Go ahead. Can I just add something? With regard to the fees, um, sometimes it's very difficult for us to compare apples to apples. Um, Florida may have a slightly lower or, or comparable fee, but as part of their capital campaign, the university provided $50 million in support to launch that campaign. So there are different sources of money that's being provided. But if I just look at MU, their operating budget is about MU development. It's about $14 million. And we provide about $7 million from the university. The rest of it they generate using their own resources. But with the $7 million investment that we're providing, they raise $170 million. And they believe that with additional support for staffing, they can actually build a foundation to create even more giving. So we have to look at how the top universities are doing, but at the same time, I think there are some critical needs for investment and development. Because our endowment currently at Mizzou, with the 178-year history, is only about $864 million. Purdue is about $2.5 billion. And so we have to look at that very carefully. But that's an excellent question. If I could add, it was a good question, and of course, uh, I've had many conversations with uh, development, and, and frankly, I think I was expressing a strong disagreement with this, and I've kind of moved to a more open mind, but I would uh, really encourage, Ryan, you to talk to development and the curators that wish more information, and Curator Farmer has said she would like more, sure. deserve a call and, and more, di more data. Yeah, I, I think that... Uh that was our, our goal for today, is to understand what the questions are, and, and then we'll, co we'll, we'll come back with a much more robust report and discussion for the June meeting and, and be working to get that information prior to the meeting. My point of view is, as we are you know, having increased limitations on our state appropriations, that the endowment could be a real source of success for us and something that I hope that we can grow over the next few years and, and, and longer. Ag agreed, and I, I think that's, uh, we, we we view this modest increase as really an ability to help us try to, to grow the endowment because uh, we do have to find the funds to invest in our development staff. Uh, but, but I think at the same time, we have to think about our spending distribution rate. And, and we will have comparisons to the, the AAU um, for the June board meeting. But I, I think uh, one of the things, too, is we have an obligation, the board has an obligation to protect the spending power of the endowment. Um, and I think in 2012, we, we had some concerns with where investment returns were going to be. Uh, the board moved the distribution rate from 5% to 4.5%. At that time, to be clear, we did not reduce the spending distribution. The spending distribution was frozen, uh, and, and we worked down to a 4.5% distribution rate over a period of time. We'll discuss this in much more detail at the June board meeting as we look at asset allocation, but our, I'll just share with the board our concerns on investment returns have not abated. Um, we, we think there will continue to be um, lower than expected investment returns and are, are recommending that the board would consider moving the spending distribution much in the same way we move from five to four and a half, from four and a half to four percent over the same period of time. Same period of time. Uh, I, I do think when you look at, I, I don't have them all in front of me, but I know we looked at the SEC, we also looked at some of the Big Ten schools. Um, 
We're not an outlier at 4.5%, but we're on the high end. Uh, many institutions have moved to 4%. Um, I want to be clear, though, for current endowments, it wouldn't lower their annual spending distribution. They just wouldn't see growth in that spending distribution, barring them raising additional funds to be placed in those endowments. Are there any questions on the proposal? And I, I think we've gotten some good information for us to think about as we move forward. If there, still, we have one, one more informational item. Right. If there are no, no other questions on that, Ryan will review the fiscal year 2018 operating budget planning for the University of Missouri system. We save this to the last because we want all the good news at the end, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I will review the, the 2018 budget process. We, we had a pretty significant discussion at our February board meeting. This is more of just an update. And, I, you know, in summary, what I would say is we're working on this right now. At the June board meeting, we actually bring the budget to the board for approval. As you can see here, here's just a high-level timeline of, of the process through which we go through. Um, and, and we were really looking at what our revenue and cost drivers are. Our two primary revenue drivers are tuition and fees and state support. And then as we start to think on the cost side, it's really driven uh, by employees uh, when you think about compensation and benefits. I did just want to provide this as some context. Our 17 budget was $3.1 billion. Today I'm primarily going to focus on our operating fund, which is there in the green bucket. Um, but I think it's also important to note and, and for the board to understand that when we step back and we think about the yellow bucket or our auxiliary operations like the hospital, um, when you combine the hospital, university physicians, and things like MU Athletics, they're over 50% of our, our all, all funds budget. For the purposes of today, I'll focus on the operating fund. Um, and, and really, when you think about the operating fund, that's where we deliver on our core mission. That's, that's where our teaching and research is conducted. Um, these slides clearly show that the primary drivers on the revenue side are tuition and fees along with state support. Combined, they represent 87% of our total revenue. This is shown on the left by the blue and red on the pie charts. Um, and then the single largest cost drivers on the right, and, and is really represented uh, by the red and blue as well, and is our salaries and wages. And it's 75% of the $1.2 billion expense budget. So we are currently estimating a decline of $8.6 million in tuition and fee revenue. This is driven by really a change in enrollment and enrollment mix, as we're anticipating declines in international students. We also have to remember that the incoming freshman class while still being finalized, will almost certainly be smaller than our outgoing graduating class. So I think it's just important to understand that we're going to be replacing our outgoing class with a smaller class. But we're still working on finalizing that. Um, the, the tuition and fees and supplemental fees we discussed today has helped partially offset that, but it doesn't fully close the gap. Um, the second component I think Steve Knorr will talk more about later today, and we're still working on what our state budget, what our state funding will look like. Um, but we're anticipating, if we looked at the governor's budget for our core, we'd be down roughly $40 million in terms of state support. And then the line items, um, we're still seeing where those fall out. But I know Steve will provide a, a more real-time update than I have today. Um, but as we begin to think about addressing this significant budget shortfall, it's important that we have a process. And as I highlighted earlier, it's really important that we're willing to look on both sides of the ledger. By that, I mean we have to look to grow our revenue and at the same time cut and control our expenses. To that end, we've requested that each of the campuses in the system find overall budget cuts between 8 and 12 percent. It's important that reserve funds not be used to address permanent budget cuts. We can use permanent, we can use our reserves if we need to transition, but we cannot simply use reserves to plug budget holes on a long-term basis. Um, additionally, when we think about this across the board, approaches to cuts will not work. It is not a sustainable model for us. And as, as the, the president, myself, and our campus leadership has worked together to establish guiding principles for all to follow through this process, this includes challenging the status quo, making decisions based on data and measures of excellence, protecting those programs of excellence, and being transparent, collaborative, and accountable in the process. We think we believe through this process we will identify those programs to be protected 
utilizing data and measures of excellence or things that are critical to the success of the university. Just as important, we will identify programs we can no longer afford to support. Finally, um, we have to be willing to invest in growth areas. Uh, it's not just about making cuts to balance the budget, um, but we also need to be looking to where we can make cuts so that we can then reinvest those in our academic mission. So it is, I just want to be really clear, we are not simply attempting to balance our budget, but we're really trying to find resources that we can also reinvest. As, as we think about what those plans will look like and what we'll be bringing forward in June to the board, uh, the plans will be presented as short and long-term plans. The short-term plans are really cuts or actions that we've already identified. The long-term plans will have the process, timeline, and dollar targets that will be executed in FY18 to fill our remaining budget gap. So those, those are really things that we know we need to be working on, um, but we'll have to be doing those in FY18 as well. But we're gonna, we are gonna be very clear that here would be the dollar targets that we'd wanna deliver from those long-term plans. This just provides um, a high-level summary of what the timeline looks like. The process is currently underway. We have a dedicated web page for this process and we will be communicating key milestones with the university community. Uh, we've also opened a Your Input page to solicit ideas from individuals, and I just submit we've received some wonderful suggestions to date. We'll be sharing those and asking for more feedback as we go through this process. With that, um, that concludes my presentation, um, and I'd welcome any questions board members might have. Any additional questions, comments? I, I have one. Uh, there's in the press a few weeks ago there was something said about our using reserves I think if I'm recalling <clears throat> even 22 million in reserves during the, the holdback and one of your points uh, was that reserves cannot be used to correct structural <coughs> explain to us and maybe the press uh, uh, how to the extent I'm correct that some reserves are being used in this uh, in this period of holdbacks um, how that it, it isn't to correct structural deficiencies but to cover the gap. I think yeah. a little public education on that would be helpful. Sure. Um, so we can, so I think commonly if we get cut in a specific budget year, we have commitments and obligations that run through that year, our planning cycles a year. So it would be appropriate for us to say that we're going to use reserves to finish out the 2017 year. Um, I think that's a completely appropriate use of reserves. What would be really challenging and not something we're looking to do is to say, well, we're going to use reserves to fill the gap for 17, and then in 18 we're going to use reserves, and then in, and we're going to continue to use them. But I think reserves are intended to soften that blow um, when we have unexpected cuts occurring, and it really allows us to manage the transition. Um, but we aren't looking to use those permanently. So I think you will hear talk of us using reserves to finish out FY17, um, but we won't be carrying those into FY18. Thank you. I've been asked that by a couple of people, and I've had a hard time explaining it the way you did, but I, I think I understand it. Any other questions? Any other Mr. questions? Chairman, let me ask this question. You know, based on what the legislature is doing right now, I noticed you said it might be a $40 million cut this year, but based on what they're doing right now, it may be even more than that, right? Yeah, if you factor in uh, where we'd end up with our line items, I, I think with our recurring line items, um, you start to get about $50 million at that point if you layer those in. But with, I think, the 9% 9, the 9 cut that was in the proposed budget, that's approximately $40 million to our core. And about half that's on the MU campus, right? Correct. There's uh, nothing else. Chairman Steelman, uh, thank you very much. And, and, and Ryan, I, on behalf of the board, I want to express to you a great appreciation for not only the thoroughness of your report, but the critical thinking that has been demonstrated that you and your staff are doing. So it's very helpful to us. It does point out the importance of our June and September meetings. So there's, there's high expectations of, of what we'll be addressing during those two meetings. Correct. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I need a, uh, before this too, and, and building on what you said, I, 
this two-hour presentation doesn't even begin to touch how hard Ryan and his team, Tom Richards, and, and, and the whole team on the campuses, too, have been working. It, there has been uh, really a lot of effort in preparing for some of these challenges, and I think I need a motion to adjourn the business of the Finance Committee. So the committee, second. committee can vote. Sure, second. Yes. <laughs> you don't think I can't manage this? As a, as, a, as a reminder, the committee members are Chapman and uh, <laughs> Layman and Snowden. You got a motion and a second. I did. Yeah. Uh, Cindy, would you call the roll, please? Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Layman? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. And Curator Steelman? Yes. Okay. All votes in favor. That'll conclude our business. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, uh, we'll break just a little bit early for the luncheon for the Board of Curators with the uh, student leaders. That luncheon will be held in the uh, Carver Turner Room, and Cindy, we're just right, uh, right down the hall? Yep, just right okay. down here. Just where it was last time. Okay, thank you very much. So we are in recess until uh, 1.45.